start. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on Twitch uh, from scratch, no libraries, no engine. Because uh, basically our goal is to figure out everything that happens, uh, sort of examine everything that happens in the entire pipeline of a game from how you draw the pixels all the way up to how the game code operates and uh, decides what's going to happen at a logistical level. So uh, right now we're kind of uh, in the middle of our week of uh, sort of starting to, to use vector math in the code. And vector math is very important because it's uh, in, in sort of the same way that you could think of uh, C and C++ as getting you a level above assembly language so that you can start to think about things at a slightly higher level uh, while still retaining most of uh, the performance benefits and the uh, sort of direct access that you're used to. Vector math is kind of like that for the scalar math that we've been doing. It basically allows us to do the same sort of operations we were doing when we were manhandling the X and Y coordinates of things and this sort of stuff. Uh, but it gives us the opportunity to start thinking about those as a pair and start defining operations that work on them as a pair, uh, which we can still use to get very efficient code, uh, but it allows us to sort of be up at a slightly more uh, higher semantic level. And sometimes you still have to go down there and muck with the individual uh, values in these, in these vectors, but most of the time you can start thinking of them conceptually and it allows you to do a lot more powerful stuff. Now, we already did some of that. We already did some of that yesterday, in fact. Uh, but before I dive into that, uh, let me quickly go over, as I always do, um, how you can be coding along uh, at home. If you are someone who has pre-ordered the game at handmadehero.org, you should have gotten a link in your email in that um, uh, download page that you would get a link to. You can download both the, uh, the, the test assets that we use for development here on the stream and uh, you should have had uh, the ability to download a zip file in which are a bunch of other zip files. You want to grab the zip file for day 43 because that is what I am starting with here on day 44. Uh, so you always start with the previous day's zip. If you unzip that into a directory and start coding with it, uh, you will be exactly where I am right now. Okay, uh, so let's talk a little bit about what we had just done in the game and then let's talk a little bit about what we are going to do uh, today to kind of uh, continue along in our, uh, in our vector sorts of, uh, sorts of experiments here. Okay, so we had just finished uh, implementing simple equations of motion for our little guy here. Um, and basically what we've done so far is we had made a little tile map, right, that the guy could walk around on. We had this, we, we don't really have, there's just sort of a static background sitting in here now. So we haven't gotten to how we're gonna render our tile map yet, but we do have the ability to kind of draw these, you know, the sort of white walls and the, uh, the doors and stuff. So he can go up a virtual staircase, he can go out the side of the screen and so on. And we just implemented the equations of motion for him. So basically he has, you know, sort of more of what you would expect uh, a, a object's movement to be when you are moving him around, right? And so as I'm moving him around, I can kind of uh, feel that momentum that we added and he, he stops, he has, he has a little bit of a, sort of a, a glide to a stop and he has a little bit of acceleration when he picks up. And that just makes uh, all the difference in terms of feeling uh, good about the character motion when you're moving around. He's already much more engaging to move around than he was even with just that simple change. And so that's more, that's sort of what we need to be focusing on, what we need to be doing for our player movement code, certainly. Uh, but we're also trying to learn about vectors here. So what I want to do is, is perhaps talk a little bit more about some stuff that we can do uh, with the vector code to sort of see how it works at a little bit, uh, starting to think about it in terms of slightly higher level stuff. Okay, uh, so one of the things that we, we did in terms of... Um, using the vector math may actually have not been all that obvious. And I sort of mentioned at the end of last stream, but I want to mention it again, because it's very important, is you'll notice that when I did all that talking about the equations of motion yesterday, and I sort of uh, was talking about how, <clears throat> a little bit of a fat finger typist there, uh, when I was talking about how we were gonna do the equations of motion, uh, and then we typed them in and we did the equations of motion just like I derived them and they worked the first time. We just typed them in and they worked perfectly. It was great. Uh, and then we tuned the constants to make the motion be what we wanted it to be in terms of how fast he accelerates and uh, how, how much drag he has, that sort of stuff. Well, what turns out to be the case is all of that derivation that I actually did, I just kind of did it as if it was scalar, right? When we did the integrals and stuff, uh, and we did uh, the work on the equations of motion, never did I actually ever say that we were working in vectors at all. We were basically just working with scalars. And so when we typed in this equation, we essentially just typed in a scalar equation, right? All we did was just solve, you know, we, we basically worked out some scalar equations uh, in Krita, right, when we, were, when we were drawing them out. And then we typed them into something that is essentially a 2D process, right? This guy can go in, you know, in any direction he wants in this 2D plane here, right? He's, he's totally smoothly moving in 2D. And we didn't have to really account for that at all. 
right? We, we totally just were able to work with those equations just like they were scalar, scalar equations. And then we plugged them into something that was using vectors and they just worked. And that's kind of, again, just a little bit of a, a slight hint about why you should always care about things like, uh, you know, sort of these more powerful math objects is just because they allow us to do things like that where we can simplify thinking about stuff instead of having to think about the X's and the Y's and the Z's and whatever, we can just think about sort of abstract quantities and know uh, that they will apply. Now there's sometimes that we have to think about things and know that they're actually vectors. Uh, and so there's things we have to learn in the math that actually depend on the fact that things are vectors. Uh, but for a lot of the time, you can actually think about scalar and vector interchangeably and that's very powerful. Um, so yeah, so there you go. So what I thought we might do today, and someone actually mentioned this on the stream, so that was kind of fun, is I was thinking that it might be uh, useful to, to um, a, good, a good thing to, to learn about vectors uh, would be to sort of see how we would do a bounce, how we would do a, uh, like a bounce off the wall, for example. So when this guy comes down here, if you were to bounce and his velocity would be reflected um, you know, in, in the other direction, right? And so what I was thinking about is maybe we'll just construct, uh, I mean, there's a couple of things we could do, but I was thinking maybe we'll just construct that case. We'll just say when our, our hero here hits the wall, we want him to bounce off of it uh, as if he were, you know, sort of a bouncing ball. That was one thing I was thinking we, were, we could do. And another thing that I would like to do maybe is make an actual uh, jump for him, where even though I don't anticipate this character jumping on command, uh, he is going to have to hop. And so coding in a jump is going to be interesting as well because that kind of involves this concept of height off of the ground, which is something I also want to get into. So we have a couple of things we can do, and I think maybe the bouncing uh, would be an interesting one of those because it allows us to talk about some of the vector math. Now, we probably won't actually want the character to bounce off the walls in the future uh, because that doesn't make a whole lot of sense for him to do, but uh, we will want things to bounce off walls almost certainly, and so we need to learn how to do this code one way or the other. All right, uh, so. If I go over here and start to construct the case so we can start to talk about that, uh, let's think about what we have, right? So let's say I've got a wall here, right? There's my wall. And I want to start to think about uh, what's gonna happen when this fellow uh, bounces off of it, right? And so I'm gonna imagine, just for sake of, uh, of simplicity here, I'm gonna say that the bounce point is at the origin of the world, right? This is at zero, zero, right? It doesn't really matter because that's a free translation. I could move everything in the world such that that were true for the purposes of doing this computation, right? And then move it back afterwards. So translation, I can always translate things to a convenient location if I want to. So I'm just gonna simplify things by uh, saying that that's what's going to happen. And so what I wanna do is I wanna say that there's gonna be some kind of inbound vector here, right? There's gonna be an inbound vector. Uh, and what we wanna do is we wanna take this inbound vector and we want to reflect it. Well, it's hard to draw today for some reason. I can't seem to draw good lines today. We want to reflect it out the other way, right? The, the sort of the notion of what's gonna happen when you do a bounce uh, is something coming in is going to get uh, reflected at almost as if this thing was a mirror, right? And so we wanna think about uh, the incoming vector as somehow giving us the information that we would need to compute whatever the outbound vector is, right? And so what exactly is happening here in, in terms of this impact and response, right? Uh, well, there's some things that we probably uh, aren't going to think about really. Like I said, we're not doing deformable dynamics. So like the fact that some, when something hits something else that makes a dent or things like that, we're not really going to think about at this point. Uh, but what we are going to think about is the fact that uh, whatever is sort of the, the velocity that comes in here, in some sense, that velocity uh, has to be conserved, right? There's, there's a certain amount of uh, physics involved here where we, if we've got a certain amount of velocity coming in, we would expect that amount of velocity to be the same leaving, right? Uh, because of conservation momentum and so on, all of your, your nice physics laws, uh, minus however much energy goes into this impact, right? So there is probably going to be some amount of energy lost in the fact that you do make a dent and so on. And so we may want to simulate that as well, that loss of energy uh, that, that comes in here, uh, in addition to what's going to happen uh, otherwise. Even if we don't simulate modifying the wall, we may want to make the bounce more realistic by saying that it doesn't bounce off at full speed, it loses some of its energy in that impact, right? Now, what's happening when this thing hits this wall, right? Well, one of the interesting things about this is this case starts to talk about vectors uh, in terms of their components, and it's kind of interesting to sort of see what's going on there. Well, what's going to happen is, uh, if I look at, I know that this vector is composed of two pieces, right? Because we've talked about this quite a bit. It's composed of its y portion, and it's composed of its x portion, right? 
And if I think about what happens to this vector, well, the wall is only stopping one of those portions, right? It's only stopping the y portion, right? So if I wanted to reflect this guy, uh, I really don't want to stop his x motion at all. His x motion can continue just as it was because there is no wall horizontally here to prevent him from going somewhere. It's only this, this wall here that's preventing him from moving vertically, right? And so I could think about taking this vector, this velocity vector, this is the speed at which he's com coming in, right? And I could take that velocity vector and just think about flipping it, right? Because this is the vector, you know, I'm, I'm, if it was based up here, that's, that's, that's not really the vector, right? The vector's actual value uh, is whatever these two components are. So if I think of the vectors being rooted at the origin, it actually looks like this, right? Um, and so what I want to do is preserve this amount, right? So this outgoing vector here is going to have this amount right here, this x amount. It's going to have the same as the incoming. The outgoing velocity is going to have the same as the incoming, right? But its, it's uh, y component is going to actually just be the negative, right? You can kind of see that whatever we thought, however fast we were moving in that direction, we're going to flip it up to here, right? And again, we could, after we compute this vector, we could do various things to, to talk about like treating it as if some energy was absorbed in the impact. We could lessen the amount that it, that it uh, bounces this way. We could just lessen its speed in, in general if we want it to go in the same direction, but lessen it. Um, so we could think about various things to do here. And that is how we would do that bounce, right? But there's something interesting uh, that I've baked in here. And this is the part where it starts to get, because I mean, if you were to look at this, you'd say, oh, well, based on that description, Casey, it's pretty easy to understand what's going on. If this is the incoming velocity, so this is the old velocity, and I want to complete compute that new velocity, right? What would I do? Well, I just told you what to do, right? If v, right, is equal to vx, vy, right? It's got two components. It's got the x component of the velocity and the y component. I just said, well, the new one's going to have the same x, and it's just going to have a negative y. I, I mean, I just, I pointed that out on the diagram. It's kind of obvious, right? There's not much to do. So why are we talking about this? And in fact, it doesn't even look like a vector operation. It just looks like we're operating on the scalars again. Um, you know, and at this point, you're just like, I'm going to go watch John play Nuclear Throne on the other channel because, frankly, you're not teaching me about vectors at all. You're teaching me about scalars, and I already know about scalars. Fair enough. But there is a rub here. What I drew was the convenient diagram where the axis along which uh, we were doing this reflection was aligned with one of the primary axes, right? X happens to be the wall. And that is why it is Y uh, that can simply be negated. What were to happen if we had the same situation, right? Even still at the origin, let's say. But now I have a slightly inclined wall, right? And so I'm actually talking about a wall with this normal to it, right? This is the sort of the, 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 the surface pointing out of the surface of the wall, right? Whereas here, the y-axis was pointing out of the surface of the wall. And now I've got this incoming thing, right? Well, now if I were to take that incoming thing and put it, put it here, right? And look at what I want to have happen uh, in terms of that reflection about the wall, because this is the wall, right? This is no longer the wall. This is the wall. Well, what am I going to do? That's not the y component anymore, right? These things have drastically different y components. There's the y component of that one. There's the y component of this one. Ain't no negative going to fix that problem, right? Uh, you are not the man now, dog, if you think that you're going to do this, right, um, to solve this problem. And so this presents us with our first sort of uh, point where we have to start thinking about vectors in terms of actual, in terms of the actual structure of them in terms of the actual fact that they are vectors and not just scalars, because now we have to start thinking about how do we work with vectors in ways that do not involve falling back to the scalars when we need to do something on just one part of them, in just one piece of them, right? And so the answer is simply that we need to get uh, familiar with, remember, uh, I, I don't you know if you, guys, uh, if you guys were with me the whole time, then you remember me talking about something called the Hadamard product, right? Uh, and I don't remember if I, is it two Ds? I don't even remember. Is it that way um, or is it that way? I don't actually know. Uh, but I talked about the Hadamard product and I said, well, that's what happens you know, if I have two vectors and I want to multiply them together. I don't really want to write cross. I'm going to write that. If I have two vectors uh, and I want to do some kind of operation between them that's multiplication, well, one way to do it right, is to multiply the components together like so. right? A times C, and that goes in the X component, right? and B times D goes in the Y component. Uh, that's called the Hadamard product, uh, and that results in another vector. 
Well, that's really, like I said, not that useful for a lot of the stuff that we want to do. So now it's time to get uh, acquainted with something that is very useful for the things we want to do. And that is the inner product, um, or better known oftentimes in game development circles, as the dot product. Okay? That is what is going to allow us to solve these kinds of problems with relative ease. You'll notice I don't have almond milk today. I've got tea. I'm, I'm, I'm doing some, uh, some, some Bengal spice. Uh, is that's basically what's happening right now. All right. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's take a look at the dot product. Try to remember these diagrams. Uh, I don't have room for everything. So let's take a look at the dot product. What I wanted to do, right, is I, I already showed you how to solve the problem if everything were axis aligned. And so what I really want to do is I want to kind of have the ability to make my own axis systems, right? Like, if I could have just created a new axis system that happened to be aligned with the wall, then I could have used the same solution that I used before, right? Um, but I don't know how to do that. And so what we're going to look at now is we're going to look at how to use the inner product to do those sorts of things. So what is the inner product? Okay, so if I have two vectors, right? Here's one vector, and then I'm going to do this magical thing, the dot product. I'm going to use the dot product here. If I have AB and I'm going to do the dot product of AB with some other vector, CD, right? Then what this actually does is instead of producing another vector, meaning instead of producing something like the Hadamard product where it had two elements and it was another vector just like the two that came in, this is actually going to produce a single value as a result. It's going to contract these two vectors down into a scalar. And the way that it is defined, right, is it is defined to be uh, the members multiplied uh, by each other and added, right? So it's A times C plus B times D, right? It is A times C, um, B times D. Now, this jumps ahead a little bit for me to explain really how this is working exactly, because we haven't quite gotten into matrix math yet. But one thing that is interesting to note, and I'll kind of show you how this, this works, is the way matrices are multiplied is actually very easy, and I alluded to it on uh, an earlier stream, in fact. But if we were to think about these as matrices, and we were to think about this first, uh, the first part of the dot product here, this, this, uh, this fellow right here, as being turned from a column into a row. So if we were to think about it being aligned this way, right? And then we take this guy, and we leave him as his columnar form. And we construct the multiplication of these two in, vector, uh, in matrix notation. Well, matrix multiplication is actually very simple. For each element that you want to compute in the result, you simply, it's basically just as easy as drawing a line uh, to find out where in each vector uh, you hit for the element. Now, of course, there's only one element in this result here. If there was uh, two matrices here, we'd have more of them. Um, but then you just work your way down, starting from the outside first, right, A and C. You multiply them together, and then you add. You go to the next one down, D and B, right? There we go. And that is uh, the dot product, right? Now, this works for vectors of any size. It doesn't matter how long they are, right? It doesn't matter at all. You still would know exactly how to produce them, because as many as I have here, D, E, F, right, G, H, I, J. L. I just take the first ones, I multiply those together, GA, I take the second ones, right, BH, and I just multiply and add, multiply and add all the way till I get to the end, F and L, right? Um, and that is how you can produce the product, right? Very easy. Uh, and so oftentimes, uh, there's the, the operation of changing something from a row oriented orientation to a column orientation like that is called a transpose. Uh, and so oftentimes you will actually see the dot product, uh, and it's called the inner product uh, as well, like I said, because of this exact look, how it looks like that. You're getting sort of the, the inner portion here, right? It's, I mean, it's hard to say without the matrix because there's a thing called an outer product as well. If I were to flip these the other way, it would produce more values. In fact, let me just show you because it's kind of interesting. If I were to flip these the other way, C, D, A, B, right? I can produce the outer product, and again, I follow the same rules. Do that intersection, right? C times A. And that's it. There's nothing more to do in either that row or the column, right? So that's one entry in my resulting two by two matrix. Do it again here. D times A, right? There's another one. C times B. D times B. 
right? You can learn matrix math in no time because basically just learning that is all you really need to know and you can compute any matrix product that you want. Um, but again, until we actually learn what any of these things do, not particularly useful. But I just want to show you that. This is an outer product, that's an inner product. And you can kind of see why it's called that because these two things like kind of form the, the smaller space there and the larger space here. But anyway, um, that's neither here nor there. All right, so the inner product dot product are oftentimes called the scalar product as well because it produces a single value, uh, no matter how big the vectors are, uh, is something that is of great utility. And it may not seem like a very useful thing right now because you're looking at that going, why would I ever care uh, about that at all? Uh, but the truth is it's actually quite useful. And the reason that it's quite useful is because this value, despite its innocuous look, actually computes to something very handy um, based on what these vectors actually are. So let's take a look at what that actually is. And I won't probably go through the trouble of proving it all um, because math proofs are only interesting to some people sometimes. Um, but point being, I'll, I'll show you the sort of the intuitive stuff to, and how to think about it. And if you want to know the proofs, uh, I can actually, maybe we can talk about them on the forums or something like that. Anyway, um, so the dot product. If I have two vectors, um, so I'm going to go ahead and say that my vectors are now uh, a equals ax, ay, right? And b equals bx and by, right? These are my two vectors. And somewhere in space, right? I'm going to think about these guys. Uh, here's my coordinate system, and I've got two vectors, okay? Like so. Now, when you compute the dot product, again, often written as, as this because of that transpose, the T means the transpose. Remember, I'm turning one on its side and then multiplying to get that thing. Oftentimes written like this uh, can also be written just as a dot and so on. There's, there's lots of different ways to notate it. I tend to use that one, A transpose B, because that's just the same in matrix notation. So that's the dot product there, right? So that, which again, uh, is just going to be AX, BX plus AY, BY, that's the entirety of it, right? That's all it is. That quantity actually equals something rather useful. It turns out uh, that it's equal to however long, and this is one way that length is often written, um, so I'm just going to write it that way for now, however long A is, right? And so I'm going to call this A and this B over here. However long A is, scalar-wise, right? Um, times however long B is, scalar-wise, right? So that length here. So this, this guy is that length, uh, and this guy is that length there, right? Times the cosine of the angle between them. So these two guys here, um, they've got this angle here, you're right? Uh, let's call that theta. The angle between the two vectors, whatever its cosine is, times the length of B times the length of A, that equals this quantity. Because remember, this is a scalar, because this is a scalar length. That's how long A is, this is how long B is, and this is how long, um, and this is the cosine of the angle between them, right? Well, again, if you want to prove this, uh, you use the law of cosines. If you know geometry, I'm not going to do it right now, but basically you can prove this using the law of cosines. Uh, if you're interested in that, you can go check it out. Uh, but anyway, that this quantity constructs uh, that actual identity, right? It actually, it, 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 this scalar value equals this scalar value. And with just that, just that one relation, we can do some incredibly powerful stuff, actually. Uh, so what stuff can we do? Well, for starters, what if we wanted to know the length of a vector? Like, I want to know how long A is, right? Well, there's two ways we could think about doing that, right? One is that I uh, told you about the Pythagorean theorem the other day, right? So we could take, here's AX, here's AY. We want to know this length here. Uh, we could do AX squared uh, plus AY squared equals whatever the length of A is squared, right? And so that is how we would compute that length. We would root this. So we would go, okay, root AX squared plus AY squared equals length of A, right? That's what we would do. And that is one way to compute uh, the length of A in terms of thinking about how it's done, right? Another way we could think about how it's done is just by using this equation. We have something in it with the length of A, right? So what if we were just to take, uh, instead of doing A transpose A and take, I'm saying, instead of taking A transpose B and taking the dot product with B, what if we just take the dot product of A with itself, right? Well, if I take A transpose A, just following this equation, I would get the length of A times the length of A again, uh, times the cosine of the angle between it and itself. Now we know that the angle between it and itself is zero, right? 
So what's the cosine of zero? Well, for those of you who don't remember your sines and cosines, all right, you know who you are out there. I'm gonna draw the circle. You could always draw the circle if you get scared, right? You could always draw the circle. This is the starting point on the circle, right? We wind up to here, right? That's 90 degrees. We wind to here, that's 180. We wind to here, right? That's 270. Wind to here, and that's 360 again, right? This is zero. Similarly, if you're doing this in radians, if you guys remember your radians, it's two pi out here, right? Um, so this is gonna be pi over here, and this is pi over two, right? And this is three pi over two. Remember the circle. As we work around the circle, right, the cosine is the x-coordinate of the point on the circle, and the sine is the y-coordinate of the circle. So if I was at zero, which is right here, right? Well, there ain't no y-coordinate. There's just the x-coordinate, and the x-coordinate is all the way out, right? So the cosine of zero equals one, right? Cosine of 90 equals zero. Cosine of 180, negative one, right? Comes back around, and so on. Hopefully you guys are all familiar with that. If you're not, get used to your unit circle. Unit circle is the man now, dog, is, is good, okay? Unit circle, good. All right. So if I do this, and I know that this is one because there's no, the angle between A and A is always zero, right? It's, an, it's right on top of itself. I know that falls out and I just get length of A times length of A, which means A T A equals A squared, right? So the square root of the dot product of A with itself is the length of A. Not surprising, because guess what? This is the equation for the dot product, right? What would happen if these were a's? It'd be ax squared plus ay squared. Exactly what was on inside my Pythagorean theorem. The Pythagorean theorem and the dot product are very intimately related, right? And you can see that. Okay. So, what else can I do with this? Surely I did not spend all that time teaching you how to do something that you already knew how to do and that we already did yesterday. And that's correct. I didn't. There's a lot more stuff in here that we can use. All right. What is it? Ooh, whoops, didn't mean to quite get that overzealous. All right, there we go. All right, so what is it that we can do with that, right? What is it that we can do with A transpose A um, <clears throat> equals length of A, length of B, uh, cosine theta? Well, the cosine theta is the part that really comes in particularly uh, handy. Right? The reason that that comes in particularly handy is because when we start to think about the cosine of the angle between those two vectors, right? If we start to think about the, what that actually means. Well, what if we could take one of these guys out of the equation, essentially? What if we could just say a priori, let's take B, and let's say B is a unit vector, right? A unit vector is a vector with length one, right? So if I said the length of B was one, it's one unit long then it would drop out of here, right? And if b is length one, then we get a transpose b equals a cosine theta, right? That's what we're actually going to get. So what does that actually do for us? Why would I care about that? Well, the reason I would care about that is because imagine that now we have our wall again, right? That wall we were talking about. Suppose we had, right, a unit vector that was pointing the direction away from the wall, right? Just suppose that's something we had. Well, now, if I have some other vector, right? I've got this vector here that's, you know, this guy's uh, doing his, his, his incoming bounce, right? Um, and so this is the vector, that's that incoming velocity. This is that incoming velocity. So here's my vector B, right, in this case. And I guess in this case, I wanna say that this is A for our equation, right? So that incoming velocity is A. Well. If you take a look at what actually happens to these two vectors, I know that the length of B is out of it. So the result is gonna be however long A is, which is, this, with the, which is this length right here, right? But multiplied by the cosine of the angle between the two vectors, right? And that cosine, again, is gonna be this, this right here, right? Uh, and to see this a little bit better, maybe it's kind of hard on the diagram, let me do it with a more, uh, in, a, in a perhaps a slightly more acute way. Uh, let, me, let me put it, at, bring it out here, right? so that we don't have to have it sort of be bent back. Let's suppose that they were more like this, so they're a little easier to see, right? So I know my result, my result is gonna have the length of A in it, but I also now the cosine of these, these uh, th that's between these is now gonna multiply it out. And what does the cosine of, 
uh, of a triangle do for us, right? What does the cosine of a right triangle do for us? Now you should remember this again from your, from your grade school trig, right? What does the cosine of a right triangle give us, right? Well, it gives us this. It gives us this edge right here. If this is the hypotenuse, right, then this is cosine theta h, and this is sine theta h, right? That's, that's exactly what that gives us. It gives us the length of that side. And the sine gives us the length of the other side, right? Times the hypotenuse, however long it was. Again, this is stuff you should hopefully all remember uh, from your grade school trig. Well, what did that construct up here? If I was to build that right triangle, right, that's built off of this angle, I'm getting this. I'm getting this amount right here, right? That's what I'd be getting. Because I know that I've taken the length of A into account, it's right here, and I know I've taken that cosine ratio into account right here, so this is just like here. Just like H cosine theta gives me the length of this side in that standard right triangle that you're used to, length of A cosine theta gives me however long this guy is projected effectively onto this vector. So A transpose B is actually extraordinarily powerful because what it lets me do is it lets me take any unit vector that I want, any one, and then for any other vector, no matter how long it is or what its shape is or what its direction is, and project it down to see where it would land on that vector, right? Now you can imagine this getting even more powerful. What if I had another orthogonal vector, right, that was perpendicular to B, also unit length, Let's say this was C, so C is also unit length. If I took the dot product with that, I would now know both coordinates of this A in a new fictional space that I've constructed, right? Instead of the X and Y axis being how things are measured, by taking both dot products, I would essentially create new coordinates for A, new coordinates in a, in a coordinate system that I set up. So essentially this A transpose B allows me to measure any vector that I want on any axis system that I want, just by setting up two unit vectors uh, that are orthogonal to each other, that are, you know, that are perpendicular, right? So imagine I want to do this. What are the coordinates of A in this new magical reference frame, this BC magical reference frame that I've, that I've constructed, right? Well, I just said what they were. They're A transpose B for the X coordinate. If this is my new X axis, I don't know, maybe it's not. Maybe that's, I should, this should be the X axis because it's right hand rule, right, going that way. Uh, so this is actually uh, not quite right. Let's say that it's A transpose C, right, is my x-coordinate, and A transpose B is my y-coordinate. That's the new vector. And that tells me the coordinates of A in this space. Make sense, right? Okay. Uh, so hopefully you're clear on that. And again, you know, I worked through all of it to show you how that actually happens, giving you the right triangle and so on. Uh, but what you really, again, you want to internalize that, and you want to spend as much time as necessary to get familiar with these guys, but the important takeaway conceptually, right, is that measuring process, okay? It's that measuring process. It's saying that a uh, vector, right, dot a unit axis uh, equals the coordinate of that vector along that axis. Make sense? Now this works even for the axes we already have. So if we were to actually take the x-axis and the y-axis and do this, we'd get the right answers. Why? Because what is the x-axis, right? What is the y-axis? Well, if we represented them as vectors, we'd get 0, 1 for the y-axis, right? There's no x component, and it's going 1 and y. And for the x, we'd get 1, 0. Well, what happens if I dot product those with some vector in the space, right? If I have ax here and ay, what happens if I dot that with one of these? Well, you should be able to do that right away. You know it's ax times 1, so that's ax, and AY plus ay times 0, which is 0. So it's just ax which is the x-coordinate of the vector in that space. Same is true if you did it for y, right? So this is like the universal measuring operator. It has a lot of other uses besides that, and we'll see them later on, um, but that's the one that we're gonna talk about right now, because with that in mind, with that power, uh, the old thing that looked so complicated where how are we gonna deal with this arbitrary wall uh, becomes trivial, right? Totally trivial now. So let's go back to our diagram that we had before and see if with the dot product we can now solve the problem that was so uh, sort of weird before and difficult. Oops, get that in there, right? So what I'm going to say is for any wall, in order to do a reflection off of it, all I need to know is I need to know a unit vector that points out of the wall, right? Also called the normal of the surface oftentimes, right? So there's my, there's my reflection. And I'm just going to call that, I'll just call that W for now, right? We'll call that our wall vector. Uh, maybe I'll call it our reflection vector. Do you want to call it R? 
I don't know, it kind of sounds like rotation. We'll call it R. And what we have to say is R, the length of R is going to be one. R is a unit vector, okay? So now I take anything that comes in that I want to reflect, any vector, right? So this is my V, this is my velocity, right? And again, I'm drawing it coming in here because that's the physical version of the diagram, but really any vector uh, is, you know, if we think about it, it's at the origin, right? So this is actually my V. And now what I want to do is I want to reflect that around here. I want to reflect that around here. So what do I need to do to reflect it? Well, I said before uh, that what I need to do to reflect it is negate its y component when it was lined up with the y-axis, right? So all we need to do now is figure out what part of it we actually would need to negate um, in this new axis system, right? If this were the y-coordinate. So how do we do that? Well, I just said I can measure any vector along... Um, along a, a, you know, a, another unit vector, which is what I have. So if I take V transpose R, right? If I take that, that will project me onto that vector, right? So V transpose R gives me this vector. Uh, well, actually, it gives me a scalar, right? It gives me a scalar, which is how long uh, this actually is along that, along that vector, right? So now the question is, that's the quantity I need to negate. Right? I need to make sure my, v, my new v, my v prime, right, my new velocity, basically is the negative of that. It's going upwards. But this is a scalar quantity. It's just a number. It's the measure along here. How do I actually, I need a whole vector for reflection. I need to construct this whole vector. So what do I do? Well, it's pretty easy, right? If I were to start, <clears throat> here we go. If I were to start by saying, well, all right, I have my v, right? I now need to change it so that I'm going to get it so that it reflects through here. I just need to add something to it, right? That's going to move it up so that it will have that reflection. And I know exactly what that quantity is. My v transpose r is the length along r that this was, right? And that's going to be negative, obviously, because we know it's going into the wall. So that's going to be negative. So if I multiply that scalar times r, times the actual, the, the actual wall reflection direction, right? That gives me a vector that gives me essentially this vector right here, right? That's, that's actually the vector now, not just the length. So all I have to do to reflect this across it is just subtract two of those, right? Just to move it up to here first and then up to here second. If I just subtract two of those, I will flip the vector around and have it go out in the other direction, right? So again, just constructing it uh, very much like it just doing what I want to do with it. So if I take the old V and I subtract two times this, the quantity over here, right, where I've got my V transpose R times R, right? That will start at my V, that will figure out how long it is along the reflection vector. It'll move me back to the even line. This will move me back to the wall, this first one, right? Uh, and then by doing two, I then move myself basically to the mirror position. And this was a bad drawing of where that would be. It would actually be like over here or something, right? So my new V prime is just that. That's the entirety, that's all I have to do. I just have to take my incoming velocity, I just have to subtract um, twice uh, whatever that measure was along, um, along the reflection vector and then move it in that direction uh, along the reflection vector, right? Make sense? Uh, and that is, of course, if I've done the math right. Like I said, I'm horrible at math, so any time we compute something like that, uh, we need to then go uh, test to see if I'm right because a lot of times I'll just make a, a straight up mistake. Okay. Um, you know what I just realized? I just realized my, my Linux has hung completely, which is unfortunate to say the very least. All right, well, that's all right. We'll go ahead and get that rebooting. It has not been a good week for Linux, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it has not been a good week for Linux. Uh, my Linux crashes all the time now. It's very unfortunate. Anyway. Um, <clears throat> so this is what we need to implement, and all we really need to do is anytime we want to bounce something, uh, we can just go ahead and say, let's go ahead and uh, define some unit vector in the direction we want to bounce, and we can bounce. And now we are not restricted uh, to just bouncing off of things uh, that are going to be, you know, aligned with an axis system, which would have gotten us a certain, uh, you know, a certain degree of the way, certainly, right? We totally could uh, have bounced off just just you know the tile map edges uh, using that, but as soon as we want to do something fancier, uh, it would not have worked, right? Because if we want to have a slant, some kind of a slanted wall in there or anything like that, um, you know, we'd be out of luck. All right, I'm going to go ahead and take one second here. 
um, to go ahead and start the hex chat back up. Uh, so I will actually be able to see questions at the end. So sorry about that. Um, again, not, uh, not the best uh, situation for Linux. Uh, let's see. Is it so hard, people? Is it so hard? It is apparently so hard. Okay, hopefully that'll stay up long enough for me to answer the questions. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, let's go ahead and just implement this. So I now want to do a thing where I compute that bounce. And in order to do that, I know that I need a dot product. So we'll open up our map um, routines and add one. So in line, again, it returns a scalar value, inner product. Uh, it takes two uh, things, and I might just call this inner because it use it so often, it's pretty obvious what it actually is. Uh, and so the result here, again, very straightforward. Uh, it's just ax uh, times bx mm, uh, plus ay uh, times by. Okay, there we go. Turn that there. Uh, and so that's our, that's our dot product, inner product, scalar product, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and that is what we're going to be computing to do our reflection code. And so if we want to reflect here, um, basically this is in the case of the tile point not being empty. Uh, I guess what we could do is say, all right, then if the tile point uh, is not going to be empty, then we basically have to figure out what direction the wall was actually in, uh, which we haven't actually done yet, but let's pretend that we do have that. So we basically have our R again. This is going to be some, some value here. Uh, which again is that r from this equation. Uh, and what we need to do is take our velocity, which again we have, it's the game state d player p. And what we need to do is reflect it uh, about there. Uh, so what we need to do is say, okay, we've got the d player p um, and the new d player p uh, for this frame, or for, I guess, uh, have we actually uh, retired the point yet for this frame? We did the test. Uh, so I guess it'll just be for next frame, this account. Uh, so we take that d player p, we're gonna have to work on this player motion code a bunch uh, to say the least, but anyway, uh, we're gonna take that old d player p, uh, we're gonna subtract two times uh, the inner product uh, of whatever it actually is and our wall vector, right? And then we're going to multiply that by the wall vector itself, right? So there we go. That's the actual equation that we need to use. Um, and oops, those were lowercase, they should not have been. I wonder if I should make those lowercase. It's a good question. Uh, it, it lines up better with the shader code if you make them lowercase because shaders have dot x dot y that sort of thing uh, if that makes sense all right uh, so what we need to now know is what actually is that so let's hard code it first uh, to make sure that we actually have our stuff working at all uh, so if we actually wanted to bounce off that bottom wall uh, that bottom wall is going to be uh, obviously just the just the y-axis. So this should do this should do the initial thing that we just sort of said was what we would do uh, if we didn't actually have the dot product or any of that stuff. Uh, so let's see. There we go. Of course, <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah. So there we go. Uh, no problems there. Uh, seems to work pretty good. Brown. Of course, I'm accelerating against it, so I kind of do, 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 do. there we go. Um, yeah, so that's pretty straightforward. Uh, nothing much to see there. Now, of course, the problem would be if we actually do that, uh, we we would have the wrong, um, we would have the entirely wrong behavior uh, because we're not actually computing the wall correctly. So what we do need to do is figure out some way to actually figure out what the direction uh, of the wall is that we ran into. Uh, and I don't think we really know very much about how to do that at the moment. Um, I guess we would have to sort of say, well, when we check these points, right, the new player P, the player left, and the player right, uh, we need to figure out which ones of them are, are not uh, actually allowed, because we don't really have much in the way of collision code at the moment. We'd have to figure out which ones of those uh, were interpenetrating, and for whichever ones were interpenetrating, uh, we would then have to figure out uh, which direction the step was between the current position and the new position, like which, which, which direction we stepped in the tile map would tell us where the wall is. And this is one reason why, you know, like I said, later on, I don't think we're going to be doing any collision detection on tile maps because it's just kind of annoying. And I don't think they're, we probably want to have like a more interesting boundary around things. So yeah. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, yeah, I wouldn't basically, um, I wouldn't basically put much, much, uh, much weight into this, this particular stuff, but the bounce code is correct. And so let's keep going with that. Anyway, so let's say uh, that what we do here is we take a look at these guys. Um, 
I guess we could just say whichever one of these, uh, yeah, this is kind of ugly, but let's just do it because we might as well we're here. Uh, so we've got a bool 32 uh, that's going to say, um, you know, uh, uh, I guess, uh, well, you know, I don't even need one of those. Uh, well, I do. Yeah, I do. Okay. So we'll just say uh, collided. And again, this is really bad. This is not at all what I would advise doing, but I just want to, we're working on the wall code right now, so I don't really want to uh, spend any time thinking about it. I just want to do something where we can get our wall out uh, and go. And since we know we're not going to be doing collision detection this way eventually, uh, it's not particularly interesting to me to, to think about it uh, much more. So basically, if the tile map is not entry there, I'm going to say collided equals true, right? Like this. Uh, and then I'm just essentially going to do that same thing uh, here. So player right, player right, um, and player left. So I'm just going to take a look at those collided's. And if I did collide, uh, then what I'm going to do here is say that there's a tile map position, um, call P or whatever, uh, and that's going to equal um, uh, that's going to equal in the case of collision whatever we actually found was the, the collision and trigger, right? Uh, whoever actually collided. And this will let me know. Uh, what actually caused us to not move, right? And so this now uh, becomes collided. Uh, if we did not collide, right, um, then we can we can go ahead and do, uh, yeah, we can go ahead and do our, our stuff. And so that shouldn't change anything as it is, right? We should still be able to do whatever we were doing before. Uh, but now we can compare and figure out what our where our wall actually is, right? So if we want to see where the wall is now, we can essentially say, well, we know we collided, right? And so in some sense, we could reverse the, 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 the sense of these so that we can get rid of that knot there so we can actually see more cleanly. If we collided with something, we just need to figure out what our wall is. To figure out what our wall is, uh, we then go, all right, we know coal P is the thing that collided. So what we need to do is take whatever the player P is, uh, right? Whatever, that, um, whatever the player P currently is which is this guy. Uh, and we just need to see uh, what direction he was trying to go in the tile map, right? Uh, so if you remember here, uh, we have the tile map position. We have abs tile X, Y, and Z. So we just need to look and go, all right, uh, if the abs tile X uh, is less than the abs tile X here, uh, then we know that this wall uh, was a, a wall going uh, in, in sort of in descending uh, the, the, the guy, the, the player was moving from a, a, a like to the left, right? The, play, the player hit a, hit a wall to the left, and we could do the same stuff uh, in all the directions. If it's if it's greater than, uh, and if it's like that, like so on. Uh, and since we can't really make anything collide diagonally at the moment, we don't. I guess we don't really need to worry about that case. Uh, but anyway, um, here we go. Uh, we can basically do. Uh, I think people were saying we could do this, right? Yes. So, uh, given that we've got, what was the complaint? Oh yeah. Uh, so ba given that we've got that, we basically just need to define the wall for each of these motions. So in this case, I'm moving to the left. So that means the wall is like, has it's normal pointing out to the right. In this case, I is moving to the right. Um, so I have the wall pointing to the left. In this case, uh, I am moving uh, up. And so the wall is pointing down, right? Is that correct? Uh, yes. Uh, Wait, no, it's less than, so it's moving down, so it'd be up, right, right, uh, and then, and then that. I believe that is all of them. Uh, potentially, understand call P is used. Uh, well, if it collided, we know that. Uh, well, all right, fine, we'll just do this. There you go. Uh, and we know that this, uh, we know that these cases can actually happen, but the compiler is being a, a bit persnickety there. Uh, so in theory, that should give us bouncing off of all the walls. Yeah, there we go, right? And so now we're just a bouncy little fellow uh, who's pretty happy about his lot in life, um, very determined to go around bouncing along things. And the faster we go, the harder we bounce, which is exactly what we wanted uh, in terms of our, our uh, behavior. Now, like I said, if we wanted to, we could make him bounce a little softer off things by basically adding a coefficient in there. It's called a coefficient of restitution. The coefficient of restitution would, re would basically be some number less than one that we would multiply our vector by to reduce uh, how far out it went. Um, and so that's, that's really all that is. Yay, bouncy fellow. Okay, all right. Sorry, I'll stop bouncing around in a second, but it's kind of fun. Yeah. 
Uh, now in theory, we don't really handle the diagonal very well, and you can kind of see that. So you can see what kind of happens up in there, and that's because we only really handle uh, bouncing off of one or the other at the time. And that's because, again, like I said, I don't think the tile maps are really that interesting way to do stuff. Uh, so I don't think we'll handle that eventually that way anyway. But what we could do if we really wanted to start doing, if we really wanted the tile map collision to be the way we did collision, uh, what we could do is, is round those off a little bit, pretend they were rounded in there a little bit and, and, and have a nicer collision there. Uh, but, but still, it, it's fine. I mean, it works. It's just it's not pretty, right? Um, yeah. All right. Uh, so now I, I got another question for you. Um, because I've given you, I've given you every, I, I give and I give stream. I've given you everything now. It's time for you to give back. All right. You're the man now, dog. Uh, what I want to know um, is basically, I told you all this stuff. I told you about the dot product, right? Instead of keeping it a secret, it could have been only me that knew the dot product this whole time. And only I can do all these awesome things. And now you know it too. So tell me with that power, how would you now do something else with the collision response? Let's say what I want to do is have him have the standard, the more familiar kind of quake style movement, where if my guy runs into a wall, then basically he just runs along the wall like that. So instead of him bouncing out like this, he just kind of goes like that, right? Smoothly along it, right? How would I do that? Now there's a trick to this. One part of it I expect you to get and the other part I don't expect you to get because uh, one of them is a programming thing and we haven't talked about that yet. But you should be able to do the math part of this. Does anyone know? Anyone? Well, you're behind on the stream anyway. I know that. So I can't really expect you to answer right away. But the reason that I think this should be easy and if you want to pause the stream and try to figure it out yourself, I highly suggest it because it should be, is that I already told you essentially exactly what you need to do to do this, instead of minusing two, you could just subtract one version of this, and that would bring you right up to the wall, right? That would bring your velocity so that it was just along the wall. So what we could do is instead, uh, just uh, instead of it being minus two, right? I could just make it be uh, minus one. Now, like I said, there's another trick to this though. Uh, so if I do that, um, there's another problem that we have to solve that it will expose that we really should have solved before, um, but you know. We, we don't really, we didn't really have to in that case, right? Now you'll notice uh, when I come on here, right? You can kind of see, well, you know, it's not as pronounced as I thought it would be. Um, it sort of happened a little bit there, but it's not as bad as I thought it would be. Uh, yeah, all right, I take it back. Maybe we don't have to fix it. I felt like we would have to fix it, but I guess we didn't. Uh, but you can kind of see now what happens is exactly what I expect to happen, which is that if I'm going diagonally down, you get that grindy wall thing that you're supposed to get in video games where you go a little slower against the wall when you're pushing into it and you go faster if you let up, right? Which is exactly what we want to feel. That, that's like a good game feel thing. Um, and so that's, right, like totally trivial. Uh, but what I thought should have had to happen, and there you can see I'm kind of sticking a little. There we go. I was, I, I was going to say it should happen. I, hopefully you can sort of see how he was sticking there a little bit occasionally. There we go, right there. See how we stuck? Um, so that's, that's the problem that I was alluding to that we had to fix. So I was kind of glad that that happened because I was like, well, I told you there, there he is, there he did again, right? You see that sticking? Why is he sticking? What's going on, right? What's going on with the sticking? I can hear you saying it. What's going on with the sticking? Uh, so the problem that we have, uh, and this is a, gets sort of to the heart of collision detection at some level. And, and we'll never totally escape this. I will show you the ways in which we solve these problems in practice. Uh, but we will always have to keep thinking about it. There's no magic bullet. Is that in the real world, collisions aren't some instantaneous thing. Everything is happening kind of continuously. And again, it's all atoms and they're all working together and this sort of stuff. And collisions are this elastic thing where something deforms a little and dents a little and moves out and whatever, right? We're simulating collision like it's this fixed step thing, right? And so what we wrote our code to do way back when, this is not something we wrote today, um, but what we wrote our code to do way back when was go, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm here, you know, here's my dude, right? So here's the hero uh, and he wants to go to here, right? But this is inside a wall. And so what we did is we disallowed the move. That's what we did. But what that means is now, oops, when we have our code uh, that's trying to do this stuff when we skate along the wall, we get into a problem where if the user is pushing down into the wall like that, right, 
we can correct that velocity, but we've already denied the move. So the hero essentially doesn't move on that frame even though we've corrected his velocity, right? So what we really want to do is we want to see if he would have collided, and if he would have collided, we want to correct his velocity and then try to move him again. And you can see why this is a bit of a nasty cycle because then your very next question should be, and legitimately should be, mind you, what happens if he collides then? So you're kind of in this nasty uh, situation where you have to deal very specifically with the discreteness of everything and go, oh, I've kind of got this nasty problem where I've got a lot of different sort of concerns there, right? And so what we could do is very simply like, you know, we could try twice and then give up or whatever. Like there's different things we can do. We'll be looking for, uh, there's, a very, there's a really interesting way I solved this on the witness that I hadn't actually seen anyone talk about before um, that I, I've sort of considered doing in Handmade Hero, but I don't know if it's the most appropriate thing for it. So I don't know if that's a good solution or not, but we will look at various solutions later when we do our full collision detection. But so for now, we'll have to do something, uh, you know, that's somewhat, somewhat not, the somewhat janky, right? That's not, that's not the nicest thing in the world. Uh, and so basically what we would do there is say, okay, if we correct our velocity, let's try using that velocity on this frame, right? And again, that's not exactly correct either. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this in a four-eye loop. We are going to do the new player P, right? We've got the player P offset uh, that comes in here, which we try adding. Uh, and then we go ahead and say, uh, once we've actually computed that D player P, we're going to write, okay. And so what we need to do now is say, all right, uh, now that we've actually computed a new D player P, we need to be able to try again uh, this basic process, right? Um, so I'm trying to think, this is a reflected vector that's happened after the acceleration was tried. And do we really want, do we want to do, uh, how do we want to do that exactly after we've clipped that velocity? I guess we just want to move him by that velocity that we actually have left. So I guess I don't want to solve this in this stream because here's what I actually want to do. And so maybe we should save this uh, for tomorrow because we just don't have enough time left. What I actually want to do uh, is I want to actually sort of show a slightly more correct collision response here, which is when we have this motion and we find that we intersect, I want to back up to the point where we hit and put the guy there and then correct his velocity and then step it forward, right? I want to do something like that. Uh, and so I would rather do that potentially. <sighs> such a tough, it's such a tough choice here, guys. Or maybe I'll do the thing I did in the witness. All right, so you know what? Let's table this till tomorrow because we don't have any time left. Let's get ready for the Q&A and let's just say this is a to be continued that we will talk about tomorrow. And I'm going to think about which way I want to solve it right now. Because I think I might want to actually try the witness way because it's actually kind of cool and I think we can just do it here. Uh, and then whether or not we can actually do it a little later on, I'm not sure. Because there's more to the witness way than the way that I would be able to do here. So let's just table this for now. It's 8.59 and we will pick it up again uh, tomorrow. So uh, we can start uh, the Q&A. And uh, basically... <clears throat> Uh, what I would like you to do is, if you could, write in and put your questions with a Q colon in front of them so I can see them. Uh, and also, uh, please keep your questions and stuff we did on today's stream or on a previous stream. If you want to ask off-topic questions, we can handle those uh, uh, during pre-stream, which is basically come 15 minutes before the scheduled start time, and I answer whatever questions come up on the stream uh, at that time. But not at this time. You will note that if you ask questions that are not related to the programming that we've been doing, I will just skip over them. It's like they didn't even exist. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Obviously with bouncing, now you need to add those annoying bouncy enemies and deadly spike walls pits later. Uh, you know, I don't really know what we're gonna do with bouncing. I haven't thought too much about that, um, but we should have something bounce off. At the very least, at some point you should be able to get some kind of projectile that bounces, because I like bouncy projectiles. Those are always fun. So we're gonna have something that bounces. Uh, we just don't know what it will be. I mean, we coded it, we've gotta use it, right? Can you explain again why the hero will stick against the wall? I didn't get it the first time. Okay, uh, yes, I can. So the reason is this piece of code right here. So what happens is the code says did we collide, right? 
Um, remember, we compute the new location for where the hero is, right? Um, when we compute that new location, we then test to see whether he could stand in that new location. That's all we were testing, remember? Because this is really old. This is, this is just simple code that we've been playing with. So we, we didn't try to do anything fancy. We just said, can he stand in the new location? That's all we we're going to test. If he cannot stand in the new location, right, he can't, then what we did is we said, all right, he won't, we won't take a step. Remember, this right here is the thing that actually puts the player in the new location. So if we enter the collided branch, we will update his velocity properly, but we will never update his position at all. So that means as long as the game, um, great, that's good. Thank you for that. I needed that. Um, as long as the game uh, is in a situation where he's trying to move and stand in a position on the other side of the wall, it won't move him at all, even though it corrects his velocity. On the next frame, it may be such uh, that that velocity is uh, is put right like you could almost let me let me actually show you exactly what's happening if you could if you could think about it um, he's got a velocity that he's built up using the acceleration that has been generated from the user input right so he's moving along moving along that acceleration has built him up to have a velocity he slams into the wall okay with this velocity he should step across the wall he doesn't because we test and see that he can't move there we correct his velocity uh, to be the bounce. Right, so, uh, I'm sorry, not the bounce. We correct the velocity to be along the wall directly. Now he's still got a little distance to the wall because remember we haven't done anything to move him right up to the wall. So he might be a little bit away from the wall and now his velocity is this. So on the next frame, we have his acceleration. His acceleration is still into the wall, but it's only a, an acceleration. So it only moves this vector down a little bit. So now he can actually move here. So he won't stick on the next frame. But on the frame after that, he might, right? because he's now accelerating more and more into the wall. And so he's constantly in this situation of kind of trying to drive back into the wall. And if he drives directly back into the wall, he will stick. So what ends up happening is as he moves along the wall, he's actually constantly getting to these stick scenarios where it's like, oh, he was into the wall, correct the velocity. Oh, he was into the wall, correct the velocity. So what we want to do to prevent that is say, okay, if the player accelerates into the wall, right? We don't want to just deny the motion entirely. We want to just correct the motion so that he moves to like here and correct the velocity. He should always still be moving as far as he would have moved in this direction, right? So he should move there, basically, right? Um, he should, so, he, so that's what we need to do to correct that. Hopefully that makes some sense. When will we scale down the hero? Um, possibly for next week. Uh, we don't really have to care at the moment because we're not really doing anything particularly touchy about that. But when we start to do the like hopping code, we'll probably want to have him scaled properly. So probably for next week, I'll maybe update the art assets file with, um, with stuff that's scaled properly. Have I considered using sine zero to sine 90 as a nonlinear inertia curve? Uh, no, we haven't really talked about any sorts of curve interpolation yet. Uh, so save that for thinking down the road. That's, I don't know that that's the one I would use because sine is more expensive to compute usually than other things that would be essentially the same. So I would, if I was trying to do an inertia curve, I would probably just use uh, a, uh, a Bezier, but you know, that's just, just off the top of my head. Will you eventually handle both the player and monsters uniformly with some kind of physics engine? Um, so I don't really want to use the term physics engine, but we will obviously have movement code that is designed to handle what the player and the monsters do together. Um, but the word physics engine suggests that it's actually trying to simulate physics, which is not really the goal here. Uh, we basically have a bunch of rules that we want to do, and some of them are based on the underlying uh, equations of motion, which are physical. Uh, and so some of it is physics E, but physics engine usually denotes uh, a sort of different objective. Do you need to code in different collision detection for the enemies? Uh, no, our collision detection will probably just be one set of routines that works relatively uniformly, but we may have special casing 
uh, because we may want to fine tune how collision detection works differently for enemies than the player and depending on how we want to do it. I mean, so there may be, there may be some things that are specific to the player versus the enemies, but in general, they'll go through the same path. Uh, this code is largely commented by video. Will you be commenting it in the source later for those who pre-ordered? Uh, we only will really do comments in the source code once we've finished a section of code um, and are kind of baking it away. Because otherwise, the comments just get out of date. E even the to-dos are already out of date a lot of times. So adding a bunch of comments is usually a bad idea. Uh, you really only want to comment code when you are actually ready to kind of bake it. Because otherwise, the comments usually end up being worse than not having comments because they actually say the wrong thing and they'll confuse people who are trying to understand what's going on. Do you plan on having non-axis aligned walls in the maps? Uh, well, I don't actually plan on having non-axis aligned walls in the maps, but I do plan on having like, what I want to do is essentially say, we're a tile map game in terms of how the like generation goes, but like once the generator says, you know, oh, this is the structure of something, right? Like here's, you know, here's, here's how the, you know, this is walkable in here and this is not. Uh, then I actually want to do like, the way I want it was coping to do it is to sort of say, well, then what's going to happen is we're going to start placing things like if this was a forest, you know, we'll start placing trees and the trees make up the wall, right? But then instead of collision detecting with the wall, we'll actually collision detect with the trees so that when the hero walks along them, they actually feel like the trees instead of feeling like a tile map. Do you know what I mean? So I don't know that we're going to have, we're not going to have like walls that are like diagonal or something, but we will have tons of like crenellated surfaces potentially or other things like that. Uh, and we may also have entities in the game that behave like walls that could be angled depending on how they go. Um, so we will have stuff where we will need to be able to compute stuff that bounces off of arbitrary surfaces. It will not be as straightforward as just doing the, the four cardinal directions. What do you think about position-based dynamics, leaving out velocity and force and doing physics directly using the current and previous positions? Uh, I think it's good. Uh, I mean, we are sort of already doing that in some sense um, because really, you're not really leaving out force and velocity in those systems a lot of times. What you're actually doing is you're just not trying to, uh, how should I say that? You still have to have a notion of how fast something is going. So position-based physics still does have to take into account velocity, right? But what you are doing typically in those systems that makes them position-based instead of velocity-based or instead of acceleration-based is where you choose to resolve basically the, the actual stepping of the, the, the time step instead of actually doing it as an integration, uh, taking many samples of the velocity and so on, as opposed to doing it directly on the physics, on the, on the positions. So you still have to know all the equations of motion. Uh, it's just about where you resolve that stuff. And so at this point, we almost are really doing that because we don't ever do anything. Uh, we don't really do e any ever numer any numerical integration at the velocity level or anything. Uh, let's see. Will the stream tomorrow morning be coding or Q&A? Uh, it's both. We always do coding and Q&A. Are we going to make continuous collision detection? Well, there's no real such thing as colli continuous collision detection. Um, I mean, obviously, we're all discrete uh, in computers. But if you're just talking about whether we will check to see whether or not uh, the guy along a vector has intersected things, yes, we will. Is the computational cost of different functions something you only learn through experience, or are there good references for C++? Uh, well, the computational cost of things doesn't actually have anything to do with C++. It has to do with the, uh, the CPU instructions that get generated by the C++. And so typically what you want to do is, yeah, you have to learn by experience what those are and how they tend to affect performance. But really, what you want to do is spend time profiling. You want to spend time timing different things in your code and learning how they work because that is really the only way. So I only have a rough idea in my head at any given time. 
of what the cost of a function is. But once I need to actually start optimizing, you have to be very specific and profile things, which is not something we've gotten to yet. We will do that much later. Yes, I agree uh, with the person who's saying that the cursor in Krita is hard to see. Um, and I'm not sure how to make it do uh, something more visible. I, I know you can do um, this thing. Do, I don't know if that, if that would help at all. Uh, I also don't know if Krita saves any of my settings. It didn't seem to. I would like it to, um, but it didn't seem to want to do that. I don't know if I have to do something else uh, to make it do that. Um, but basically, uh, yeah. It doesn't ever seem to save, save the size of the brush, uh, but I guess it saved the cursor, so that's fine. So that's something anyway, right? Uh, let's see. Are there any situations in which Euler angles are more useful than quaternions? Okay, we're definitely, that's, that's definitely a question for much farther than the future. And first of all, I don't know that we'll ever, that will ever be a question for the stream because quaternions are only really necessary for 3D rotations, which we won't really have to deal with. Will you end up running into problems when walking into a corner after the sticking fix tomorrow? Um, it depends on how we fix it. Possibly, it depends. Will there be minimum distance to the wall where any input towards it is summarily replaced with par parallel correction vector without looping over possibilities? Uh, well, so it de like I said, it depends on how we implement it. I'm toying with maybe doing the witness thing, but I just, if we were gonna stick with tile map collision, I would definitely do the witness thing, but I don't know based on where we're gonna go with it, I don't know if that's a good idea or not. Would computing a vector that moves the player just above the wall but still along it solve the stopping problem in collision? Uh, well, so the problem is not computing the vector because we did compute that vector, right? That's what this does. This computes exactly that vector. Uh, the problem is that we only compute that vector after we know that we collided. And when we know that we collided, we don't accept the, um, the new position, right? Does that make sense? Um, so we have a bunch of work to do here to figure out how we're going to make it so that we can test a position and accept the position while doing a correction in between was the problem, right? If that makes sense. Oh my God, my, am I reading this right? I feel like the moderators of the stream are now arguing over you're the man now, dog. I get the projection of V onto R, but don't you end up just pointing back on negative R by multiplying the projection by negative two R? Where is the other component of the bounce handled? I see, I see the question, and that is a good question. Uh, so let's go ahead and answer that question. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna draw it orthogonally for you. Uh, rather, I'm gonna draw it without an axis system so that we don't have the axis system in there, right? Here's R, okay? It extends infinitely in all directions, but its length is only one. So, you know, it's, it's this direction, but, uh, you know, length of R equals one, right? And so now we have something that's coming in and it's hitting here. And so here is the vector, right, that is hitting. Uh, this is the velocity vector. So this is V. We want to compute a new V, right? We want to compute a V prime that is up here. And so what we are trying to do is perform this flip. Now what you will notice is this component right? Whatever this axis is, we don't even know what this axis is. We didn't even give it a name. It's the wall axis, right? But that portion of this vector, we don't want to touch, right? This and this both map to the same location on this other axis. So we don't need to modify that coordinate. 
All we need to do is flip this guy around, uh, you know, all we need to do is handle this coordinate, th that y. We don't need to touch the other one. So that's why we did v plus our bounce expression, right? And I mean, technically v minus, right? We did v minus 2, v t r, r, right? It's because we start at the existing velocity. And all we're doing is applying the correction that does the flip. That's why we don't have to handle this specially. Now, we could, if we wanted to, handle it specially, right? We could have another thing here, which would basically be w, right? And how would we do that? Well, then our v prime, right, we would construct it by saying, what's our v prime? Well, we know that our v prime should have this vector in it, right? It should have that, right? So, so it, 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 it's, it's, its length along r uh, should be the negative of whatever it was, right? And so we're like, okay, so we know we want to subtract v transpose r r to sort of start by getting us up to here, right? Because this is v transpose r, right? This length. So negative v transpose r would get us up to here. And now we need to add this part back in, right? We need to add, we need to add this w. Well, what's that? Well, that's just going to be v transpose w, right? So it would be v transpose w times w. And remember, these are scalars and these are vectors, right? Hopefully that makes some sense. This would be our new, um, this would be our new uh, vector. And we could compute it that way if we wanted to. It just means we have to have a second vector in here, which is this w vector. Now, what do we know about the w vector, right? Well, we know that the w vector is perpendicular to the r vector, right? So we know basically that, that, um, that and this is jumping ahead a little bit, but we know that this is true about their inner product. Why do we know that's true? Because what was that equation I showed you before? I showed you the equation, length of A, length of B, cosine angle between them, right? Well, what's the cosine of the angle between two perpendicular vectors? It's 90 degrees, right? If it's 90 degrees, the cosine of 90 is zero. That means it doesn't matter what anything else is, this is zero because these guys, no matter what they are, can't multiply zero to be anything other than zero, right? So we know that W transpose R is zero, right? So if we looked at, at this extra expression that we added here, we've got a negative VTR, and then we've got a positive VTWW, right? So we've got VTW times W, right? And so this, we know, you know, if we're, if we're going to basically say, well, you know, we're going to try and make... Um, we're going to try and, um, uh, sorry, I, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Oh, we're going to try and say, well, well, you know, these two things should be equal, right? Well, negative V2, VTR, R, you know, V minus v, this uh, and this, if they should be equal, I should be able to set up that equality, right? If, if, I'm, if I'm telling you that this is true, right? And so what I'm, what I'm saying there is that V, uh, this, this OVALTS equation, 2 VTR, R, um, that should equal this equation, negative VTRR um, plus VTWW, right? And you can kind of start to see, okay, well, if I transfer this to the other side, I would get V minus VTRR, that goes away, right? Because it adds one uh, to that, and VTWW, right? That's what that is. So what that's telling me is V transpose W times W must be equal to V minus V transpose RR, right? And we actually can see that that's true, right? V, which is this term, minus V transpose RR, right? Which is this distance times this vector, which is this right here, right? Is equal um, to this point, V transpose W times W. That is exactly what we expected to see, and it is what we see, right? Uh, and so that's where that comes from there. Um, yeah. So uh, there's not a whole lot else I could really show you about this without going into to this and substituting in. Basically, we'd, what we'd have to do is say, well, let's break up V into uh, the sum of two vectors, one of which is, is going along R and one of which is going along W or whatever, and then see how they dot out and blah, blah, blah. But you get the idea. So hopefully that makes it a little bit clearer. Is there a way to speed up the draw bitmap code? I'm trying it on my laptop and it doesn't hit 33 FPS. Um, there are a lot of ways you could speed up the draw bitmap code. Um, 
I don't really know that I want to talk about them right now, though, because one of our very first tasks after we sort of finish getting our basic movement, basic, uh, you know, gameplay stuff in over the next couple of weeks is to write the renderer. Um, so I'd like to save it for then because we're going to actually write a whole renderer and that'll be the time uh, when we'll look at it. If you're looking at just the basic thing that you might want to do, um, if you haven't already done it, if you're just trying to make it run faster, what you could do is, is turn on optimization, right? Um, so if you go in here uh, and you, you look at this and see optimization switches O2, um, if you put that O2, if you just, if you just put an O2 in here, uh, that would compile it uh, to, to probably run quite a bit faster. So if you haven't done, already done that, you'd want to do that. All right, it looks like we are done with questions. Do I have any more questions? If so, we, we wow, this is an early q and I don't know if that means nobody knows what I'm talking about when I talk about the math. That, that, that might be the case. That might be the case. That would be too bad. I hope that's not true, but it might be. We had some good math questions, so some people obviously know totally get what the math is doing. Uh, but I hope it's not too much math. Sometimes people just their eyes glaze over when we go to the math, but uh, it's really easy to understand if you always just think back to what the actual stuff is doing. And, and you can get it, trust me. Um, I am really bad at math, so if I can do it, you can do it. Uh, you just gotta be willing to kind of dig in a little bit and actually start practicing uh, with those things. Oh, yes, uh, whoever just suggested removing the background. Yes, that's a good point. So if you are having trouble, we're basically blitting a giant background here for no reason. Um, so if you wanted to, uh, you, could totally, you could totally do that. Just, just comment out this code, right? Um, and, and that would be uh, you know, an easy way to get it to run faster. Uh, if you want to put a clear in there as well, you could. Um, but you know, sometimes it's fun. Yeah. Whee! Oh no! I drew the triangle wrong? I'm sorry. Let me draw the triangle again. It's bound to happen when I'm drawing stuff quick math-wise. Well, actually, it's usually the case that I'll make an actual math mistake. It's a miracle that I haven't made one yet. Okay, when I drew this, uh, someone was saying I, I put it on the wrong side. I was, I was trying to write this, uh, but I think I, I must have inverted them, right? Uh, so just to be clear, on the right triangle, this is how it should go. And we did everything else right. Like the dot product when we drew it was, you know, working correctly. But yeah, sorry, I don't, I don't know why I did that. Sometimes I get carried away. Uh, so yeah, so it's, it's, it's this guy. Um, it's this side. And so that's why, again, dot product wise, uh, when you've got the two guys in here, uh, when you're doing that mapping, dropping it down, uh, here's that, that guy. You don't get this length, right? That would be sine theta. Uh, what you get is this length. Now there is something that does give you sine theta, right? That's called the cross product. Um, but uh, but we haven't gotten to that yet, and we probably won't do much of that actually because you don't really need it uh, in two D very much. It's more of a three D thing. Maybe you can mention formal keywords like projection, transformation, and spaces so people can look things up if they need to. Uh, yeah, so I don't know that we've quite gotten to some of those things yet, but yeah, I mean, if you think that is, um, I mean, we haven't really gotten to matrices or all those sorts of things. So I don't know if they'll be a little too confusing for people to kind of jump straight into that. Uh, but in general, um, essentially, Matrix math, when you actually do uh, transforms, matrix transforms, they are actually a series of dot products. And so you can actually go look up, like he was saying, spaces um, and transforms. Those are things that will talk about this sort of behavior, but a lot of them, it's really hard to, I don't even know what to point you to to look up for more information. I don't know who explains these sorts of things in a good way necessarily. 
Uh, so maybe go to the forums if you're having trouble with stuff and ask. And some people who are more math inclined there might have some good resources that explain these in nice intuitive ways instead of just throwing tons of equations at you and hoping that you know what they're talking about. Was the witness collision trick to try and maintain the distance traveled? Uh, no, the witness collision trick is to do movement as a search problem instead of as a, as a physics problem. Uh, let's see here. Why does wall bouncing not seem to cause, cause sticking, but wall sliding does? Well, if you think through uh, the way that code works, hopefully you can kind of see uh, what's actually going on there. Uh, so let's take the, the situation with bounce, right? So I got this situation, and I'm going to deny this move, but I set the velocity to here. So that means on this frame, the guy doesn't move at all, which we just can't see because the frame rate's so high. If the frame rate was like, you know, 10 frames a second, we'd see him stick just at every bounce, right? So one frame he doesn't move, but on the next frame his velocity is pointing in this direction. So he's definitely going to move now. So he could never stick on the wall for more than one frame, right? But in the other scenario where all we do is do that, then if he gets close enough to the wall in floating point math, for the amount of acceleration that we add every frame to make it so that every frame, it's constantly we correct it, but then on the next frame it moves the acceleration to here and he tries to go into the wall again. He could just stay there constantly trying to get into the wall, right? And never move anywhere. That's never going to happen with this because if he's pointing into the wall, on the next frame he's pointing out of the wall. But this will never make him point out of the wall, right? He'll only point even or in. In fact, it's always slightly in because if, you're, if I'm holding down the keys, trying to push him into the wall, he's always having acceleration added to him that pushes his velocity vector into the wall. Abner, yes, we will have debug info rendered on the game itself. Um, that is something we, we will be doing once our render is kind of up. Somebody says that you can look up a lot of these things on Khan Academy. Um, so I don't know if that's good or not, but that's maybe one place to look for more math stuff. Will the rendering code be able to squash the bitmaps, for example, to signal the collision? Yes. Uh, well, I don't know that we'll necessarily do squashing into a collision, but um, we will allow bitmaps to be squashed and stretched, yeah. In fact, that's kind of an interesting problem, actually, that people don't talk about very much. Um, there's, an interesting, there's an interesting part about bitmap squashing and stretching that, that is... Um, I guess I would say is I'd never seen it actually just put forth as bluntly as it probably should be. Um, and so when we get there, I will be bluntly putting it forth. Could you, would you benefit from unrolling the collision check loop using a predefined number of segments along the movement vector? We don't actually have a collision check loop at the moment. Um, but unrolling loops nowadays is usually not particularly useful, depending on the circumstance. Um, so it depends what you're talking about. Since we don't have a collision loop yet, I can't really say uh, if there'd be any benefit to unrolling it. All right. I think that is the end of the questions. So that is the end of the stream, even. Um, there we go. Uh, so. Thank you everyone for joining me. It was a pleasure coding with you for a very mathy handmade hero tonight. Um, if you would like to follow along at home, uh, you can pre-order the game on handmadehero.org and it comes with all the source code. So you'll get a link in your email that allows you to download every night uh, after I finish coding, I upload the source code. You can go ahead and, uh, and grab that and play around with it, which is a great way to learn because you can try out different stuff and see what happens. Uh, if you want to support the video series, we do have a Patreon as well. Uh, and uh, we've got a news and forum site that's pretty cool to go to. It's got a lot of useful stuff on it, like the schedule for the week is up there. Uh, there's an episode guide if you want to catch up with old episodes. got time-coded uh, videos up there for you. We have the coding resources page with ports to Mac and Linux uh, and other stuff that's uh, pretty handy. 
and a code discussion forum you can ask questions on if you would like to ask questions. So if you're trying to learn from the stream, I highly recommend going there. It's a great place to check out. And there's a lot of very helpful people, very nice people up there uh, who answer questions and stuff. So uh, thank you very much for joining me. We will be back here again not too long from now uh, at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. Uh, to do uh, some more uh, work on the player movement code. I'm not sure what we'll do after that. I think I want to maybe start getting into jumping and bouncing, that sort of stuff. Uh, and so that's probably what we'll get into. I don't know if we'll get into tomorrow, but certainly starting next week, we will get into that because that's what I'd like to do uh, as our next step that we're going to do with vectors. So uh, again, thank you very much for joining me, and I hope to see you all tomorrow. And if not, if it's too early in the morning, I understand, uh, I will see you Monday. So thanks for tuning in, everyone.